Hello everyone, Lane Reidenauer here for our combined Sunday School classes at First Presbyterian Church in Greensboro. Since we're unable to worship together in person, we are so very grateful for the technology that allows us to worship together online here on this Easter Sunday where we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll start off with a hymn. I'll put the words up on the screen and you are more than welcome to sing along and celebrate Easter. Our hymn today, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. It comes from the 14th century. It was a Bohemian hymn written in Latin and a gentleman named John Walsh translated it into English in 1708. Charles Wesley added a verse in the years that followed. Perhaps it's our most familiar Easter hymn, Jesus Christ is risen today. Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia. Our triumphant holy day. Alleluia. Who did once upon the our heavenly King. Alleluia. Who endured the cross and grave? Alleluia. Sinners to redeem and save. Alleluia. Sing we to our God. It was early, not quite light, but they were awake and ready to go. None of them had really slept anyway. When crises and tragedies hit, after all, it is almost impossible to sleep. No one could grasp what had happened. Was the Passover festival still going on in the city? Was it only a couple of nights ago they had shared a meal together? Had they not been singing and laughing and having so much fun? Everything happened so fast. Jesus was arrested in the garden and taken to the high priest for a so-called trial. Early the next morning, they brought him to Pilate and he had been condemned to death. After beating him brutally, the soldiers marched him through the streets, carrying his cross and crucified him outside of the city walls. He was dead within hours. They had seen it, but they still could not believe it. And on that afternoon, they found themselves in a strange city outside of the city walls when he died. They had to get back to town and to safety for the Sabbath and then sit for almost 36 hours waiting. First light was their opportunity to go to the tomb where his body had been hastily placed and prepare him for burial. They were ready. But burial, how could Jesus be dead? They needed to go there to be with him, to let it sink in. When thinking about stories like the ones we are going to deal with today, biblical scholars like to focus on the details. And when we begin to put these details together, we can also imagine more fully 
just like I finished doing what the situation was at hand. One thing about these stories really jumps off the page. All four Gospels place Mary Magdalene at the tomb early that first post-Sabbath morning, but only the Gospel of John shows her there alone. The earliest Gospel written, the Gospel of Mark, also includes Mary, here identified as the mother of James, and Salome as among that group. The writer of Matthew says it was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And the writer of Luke agrees with Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, but adds Joanna and the other women with him. Today, on Easter, we are going to listen to these first witnesses to the resurrection. We want to walk with them to the tomb and consider who these women were, how they fit into the circle of people around Jesus, what they saw, and why it is important that the gospel message started with the testimony of these women. To do this work, I want to start at the site of the crucifixion because many of the women named at the resurrection are also present at the crucifixion. Their presence and their loyalty to him in these hours is something that we can overlook and we should not. The writer of the Gospel of Luke is relatively simple about who's at the cross. It says, but all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The Gospel of John says, meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. But it is Mark and Matthew I find most intriguing. Mark reports that there were also women looking on from a distance, and among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and Yoses, and Salome. They used to follow him, Mark says, and provided for him when he was in the Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. Likewise, in Matthew, we read, many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. It is intriguing in Mark and Matthew to me because of the verb there. It is diakoneo. That is the word from which the term deacon comes. And yes, it is a word rooted in table service. But the writers here are not simply suggesting that these women tended to the practical needs of a group that is traveling. That is, we're not to think of these women as the cooks and caretakers for Jesus and his disciples. We see, for instance, at the outset of Luke 8, something similar to what Mark and Matthew include in this report. Soon afterwards, Luke says, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Hutza, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them, some translations read him, out of their resources. What these writers are telling us is that these women had financial resources and those resources were being dedicated to the support of Jesus and his circle. Indeed, these women were a part of that circle, serving this community in a variety of different ways. Draw the contrast to some of the men. The Gospels certainly do. In the Gospel of Luke, for instance, the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest among them. And Jesus says, For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Same verb. 
And I could go to a number of other gospel stories where Jesus is pointing this out. It is, again, important that we not limit our picture of these women's service before or after the resurrection to particular roles, especially to domestic ones. We tend to do that. Remember Martha and her sister Mary? The text implies that Martha, like other women in Jesus' circle, took care of business and necessities that supported Jesus' ministry, including running large households that earned enough to support his cause monetarily, in addition to doing basic things like feeding and housing. Yet other women, like Mary, who sits at his feet, may have traveled with him, learned along with the other disciples, and taken on different roles within his circle. We could add to their roster some leading women of the early church, the apostle Junia, the only woman in the biblical text assigned to that role. Phoebe, a deacon from Simcrag, by whose hand Paul sends his letter to Rome. Prissa, part of a dynamic couple who led churches. Or Lydia, businesswoman and the first European convert. I could go on for some time. Of course, some of what these women did for Jesus was culturally conditioned, but that does not have to mean lesser. Now, we also know that the resurrection accounts often named people as witnesses as a way of confirming their legitimacy in the early Christian community. That is, written some 35 to 60 years after the death of Jesus. These mentions give us insight into who was important in the nascent church. And thus we find Mary Magdalene, the only woman named in all four Gospels at the Resurrection, to be a far bigger deal in the early church than many of us know. Most Christians in the West think of her as a reformed prostitute, even though that designation runs counter to any biblical or extra-biblical evidence. That idea started circulating widely in the 5th century, perhaps as the result of the proximity of her name in Luke chapter 8, the section we just read, to a Luke 7 story of an unnamed sinful woman who anoints Jesus' feet. But maybe it was an attempt to lessen Mary Magdalene's influence and that of other women in the church. After all, it is not an uncommon way to sully a woman's reputation to call her a woman of ill repute. Whatever the cause, the idea stuck. By 1591, Pope Gregory the Great articulated this misidentification in a sermon and both showed the power of this rumor as well as cemented it in the Western tradition. But what counter evidence is there? First, this Mary is a woman known not by the name of her husband or her father, but rather is recognized by association with the city near the Sea of Galilee from which she came. This connection is likely drawn because she had a reputation of prominence in that place. People knew who she was. Second, the only other thing we are told about her in the biblical text is she was one from whom seven demons had gone out. What that phrase means is ambiguous at best, but it is typical to say that Jesus cured her of a serious disease. There is no indication there was anything sexual in nature happening here. Third, we also know that parts of the early Christian tradition lauded Mary Magdalene as an apostle to the apostles. In fact, there are multiple second century textual records, including ones where she and Peter are clashing and she comes out looking better than he does. One of those pieces of evidence comes from a gospel of Mary, which is named for her. And she was described as a close companion of Jesus by this text and others. Fourth, Eastern traditions never went with more negative ideas about her. 
Indeed, there is a great Orthodox legend explaining that Mary Magdalene went to Rome after the crucifixion, got an audience with the emperor, and denounced Pilate for his handling of Jesus' trial. She then began to speak with him about the resurrection and picked up a hen's egg from the dinner table, so the story goes, to illustrate her point about something new emerging from the tomb. The emperor supposedly replied there was as much chance of a human being returning to life as there was for the egg to turn red. Immediately, the egg miraculously turns red in her hand. It is because of this tradition that Orthodox Christians exchange red eggs at Easter. And I might add that there are many European traditions that venerate Mary Magdalene. Travel anywhere in the south of France and you will see churches dedicated to her, many with relics, because they believe she came and spread the gospel there. Now, what about other women at the tomb? That is far trickier. The other Mary mentioned at both the cross and tomb could be referring to Mary, mother of Jesus. This is considered highly unlikely, however, because most people think that she would have been identified as his mother were she there. We have this mention of the sons and they could simply be brothers because they are associates of Jesus in his circle and their mother was there. We do have this curious phrase in the Gospel of John about his mother's sister being there followed by the words Mary the wife of Clopas. Is this one woman or two? It could be either but it might indicate that this woman is an aunt to Jesus and that the brothers mentioned are cousins. This Mary, who is wife of Clopas, could be making reference to Cleopas from Luke's post-resurrection story at Emmaus, but we're not sure. The mother of the sons of Zebedee is also called out at the cross at Matthew. These boys were James and John could be a conflation of all these other Marys, or it could be a specific recollection. Salome is unique to Mark, and then there is this Joanna, who is unique to Luke, and we've met her earlier, but she's only mentioned in two places in the entire Gospel account. What happened on that morning also varies a bit in each Gospel, but here are some key things to carry away. First of all, the grave was empty. For those women concerned with their task, it was a shock to arrive at that place and for that tortured and brutalized body to be absent. I imagine that they were not all that different from us. And we know that when we lose a loved one, we often engage for a while in what's known as magical thinking. We expect that the person will be there at the supper table, on the phone. And we struggle with final things like removing tangible evidence of that person's presence. It seems unreal to us that we are still here and that person is gone. These women, and this is brand new to them, are in a shocked and liminal place. They might have witnessed him dying, but they still had not fully grasped what it meant for them in their every day. Caring for a body and going through the rituals would certainly usher in some of that finality. It might not feel altogether real yet, but it would start demarcating the space for them to make sense of what had happened. But that's not how the story goes. They arrive at the grave and he's not there. And then to encounter, depending on which version you read, an angel, angels, or Jesus himself in some new form, no doubt was frightening and disorienting. The way that things around death and crisis typically are. It is one of the reasons that I adore the so-called original ending of the Gospel of Mark, which comes in verse 8 before some later post-resurrection memories were appended onto it. It reads, 
So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Tromos means trembling, and ecstasis is like our word ecstatic. It's the idea of being almost in a trance-like state. For these first witnesses to the resurrection, it was a terrifying place to be. Their minds and their bodies apparently were overloaded. Many of us have been in a crisis, and we can identify with the shock, the fear, the displacement, the nothing making sense, and how our bodies physically react to that. It is, for me, the best description of what that morning must have felt like. It is visceral, more descriptive than, and they were afraid. If we take it seriously, we are finding that their stories do not give us an Easter morning that is celebratory or triumphal. It gives us dumbfounded, terrified, trembling, and disoriented. It gives us women running back to the others, probably looking and sounding half crazy. But we are intentionally given these women as witnesses, and they are also guides to what it is to experience resurrection. What they model reminds me of something the great American preacher, Harry Emerson Fosdick, once said, I would rather live in a world where my life is surrounded by mystery than live in a world so small that my mind could comprehend it. You see, this morning did not need to make sense to them. They didn't have to grasp the whole picture. They were willing to be baffled. It was okay for them to be afraid. But they could still say what they did not fully know. Indeed, at least in the Gospel of John, we get something quite beautiful from Mary Magdalene. The writer says, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them he had said these things to her. I have seen the Lord. This Easter, I want to encourage us to be with her. In a time where we have been surrounded in our country and our world with too much death, when our hearts have been heavy and grieving, when our lives have been turned upside down, we stand with Mary Magdalene and with these other women in a morning garden, prepared to come face to face with tragedy. Can we in these times say, I have seen the Lord? It may be more present to us today because of this pandemic, but we always live in a world filled with pain and with sorrow and with death and with the kinds of injustice and oppression that led to the death of Jesus. How do we say in the midst of all of that, I have seen the Lord? How do we embrace a mystery that knocks the breath out of us, makes our bodies tremble and our hearts race with the adrenaline? How do we stop weeping and cease mourning and embrace life? The magnificent Maya Angelou said it this way, have enough courage to trust love one more time and always one more time. And that is where we are on this resurrection morning with these women. I think Thomas Merton says it best for me when he writes this. You do not need to know precisely what is happening or exactly where it is all going. What you need is to recognize the possibilities and challenges offered by the present moment and to embrace them with courage, faith, and hope. These despairing women were where they needed to be to see the risen Lord. They were not shuddered away from their darkest moment. They went to the grave to face death head on. They fretted over an empty tomb. They were scared by what they experienced there, but they stayed in the moment. 
and they saw the Lord there. Let them this Easter be our guides. Let them show us how, in our worst moments, to see the God of light and life working, creating, bringing new things forth. Let us, too, see the Lord.